I'm Will Aubrey. It's time for another edition of the Improbability Engine. I'm here with my buddy Joe Darnell. And Joe, as always, we begin with our moment of what? Yep, Will. And uh, let me tell you something. There's been a lot of weird things going on since the last since last we spoke. And uh, the one that stands out to me is has to do with the Olympics. And this is the Winter Olympics, so of course everybody loves curling. Uh, in which case, at the end, they'll forget that it exists until the next four years, whenever curling comes back on. Uh, or unless you are a serious insomniac and watch ESPN2 at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, but mine is actually of another Olympic sport, possibly the most difficult Olympic sport of all. Okay. The biathlon. Now, for those of you who are who are listening to this thinking, well, a biathlon, that means there's only two things you do. It can't be as hard as the decathlon, which has 10 events you got to do. Th this is where you go into the bookstore and try to get the athlon NCAA basketball preview before <laughs> right. anybody else. Yeah, right? I like to buy athlon. This one right now. Is it in yet? No, it's not in. Okay. Well, right. let me call somebody. No, the biathlon is cross country skiing. And then shooting. And if you miss the target, you lose time. And you, I mean, there's penalties and it's all the. Let me tell you something, Will. I've done both of those things in my life at separate points. Both are incredibly difficult to do well. But let me tell you what the most difficult part of this is. I'm going to go cross country ski, which I don't care what the Nordic track people say, it is not good for you. <laughs> okay, it is not good for you to cross country ski. It is the most difficult thing in the world to do. Oh, and by the way, you're going to be racing up and down hills on skis, and when you stop to take a break, I'm going to need for you to take the rifle off your back that you've been carrying and shoot five targets without missing. And they said on the broadcast, if you miss, you have to go 150 yards further. It's just ridiculous. It is it is a hellscape of terrible ideas because this isn't being done at like sea level where there's oxygen. This is done at altitude where things die, where trees no longer grow. That's how bad it is. I watched a guy do the biathlon and I, I thought to myself, there's no way I want to do either one of those things right now. Thanks. I'm, I'm really good. So whenever the, the Frenchman finally won the, the, the biathlon that I saw, I was exhausted. So I had to change the channel. Here's my moment of what. Okay. Okay. Uh, when I was really into the Olympics, the 80s, even into the 90s, the spots on the Olympic team were determined by the Olympic trials. Right. Okay. Yep. And now, in at least some sports, <laughs> they're determined by a committee that selects people yeah. instead of you winning your spot during the Olympic trials. Right. Okay? And <clears throat> I, I'm not going to criticize the committee's choices. It's just that how dare you change things from the way they were when I was young? <laughs> <laughs> that was the best way. That's the way it's meant to be. How dare you change it? What you find is that in those instances, especially with highly subjective sports like figure skating, figure skating to me is it, it, it's a crapshoot because the way they have it broken down, certain judges like certain things. Um, the, the old joke back in, in the eighties was, oh, and the Russian judge gives a five. You know what I mean? Like it was always the, the Belarus, oh, the judge from Belarus gives a high penalty on that one. It, that's how it was. There was a certain aspect of that, that fell into the sphere. And I won't say that it was a political sphere or, or, uh, anything like that. Probably more along the lines of certain areas of the world emphasize certain aspects of technique that they then harp on and they don't give as much credit to other things. So whereas you well, might be the how best does American, that connect to <clears throat> you might select the best Americans in the American judging system, or you can pick the ones that you think will do best in a global competition where the judges come from different areas. Right. Moving right along. Yes. Let's talk about racer basketball. What a ride it has been, Will. This team, um, 
A lot of fun. Tied for first place in the Ohio Valley Conference. Back they where we on, belong. They were on a, on a roll, playing <clears> extremely <throat> well with two of the best players to ever play for Murray State. Absolutely. In John Stark <laughs> and Terrell Miller. Absolutely. And, and you can't really – I don't think you can overestimate the value of those two players uh, in the lore of Murray State history. I mean, we're talking about John Stark. This is a guy that over his four-year career, now he's not at Murray State the entire time, over his four-year career has scored 2,068 points. Now, by my figuring, that puts him in the top five. If all four years had been at Murray State, he'd be in the top five in scoring. This is a guy who has scored a ton of points in his career. And to give you an idea for Racer fans, he's 123 points from the Terry Mays' two-year record at Murray State. And we all know what kind of score D.T. Mays was. I mean, one of the best one of the best scorers of the basketball I've ever seen in my entire life. With four regular season games left in the OVC tournament, he's got a chance at that record. I think he does, too. I think, uh, well, and especially the way he's played here recently, scoring over 25 points a game on a stretch. You know, he's done really well scoring. If he can average 23 or 24, he might even break it in the regular season. I mean, that's just how how amazing a basketball player he is. And what's funny about Jonathan Stark, I was looking at his stuff. He's taking less shots now this year than he did last year. Um, he's taking less threes, less twos. He's just shooting the ball less. Now, the best part about that is all of his percentages are flat or better. I mean, he's shooting better than, he did, than he did last year. He's just scoring a couple fewer points a game. And a lot of that is, okay, he's got guys he can give the ball to. He doesn't have to force as many shots. But you want to talk about the definition of unselfish. When you walk in and you know you're the best guard on the team and you say, you know what, no, I'm going to pass up a couple shots a game. That's the kind of guy you want to have. Absolutely. I mean, because he's his percentages have gone up. His scoring has come down marginally. But he's just incredible. An incredible basketball player and, and recently named uh, – College Insider's mid-major player of the week, which is a big deal, you know, getting some national attention. He deserved it. He's a fantastic basketball player. And Terrell Miller's having a great season as well. <laughs> Terrell Miller, I think lost in all this is just how effective Terrell Miller has been at, at being the focal point in the post. We all know that the OVC officiating is not good. It's inconsistent. You never know what you're going to get. Terrell Miller has learned how to be effective and stay on the floor. And that is incredible for a college basketball player to do in a situation like that. Well, uh, one thing that – one thing about OVC officiating this year and officiating in general at the college level that I've noticed is they're calling fewer fouls. They are. And I, I think that it's because – Players and coaches have learned to adjust, and they're they're committing fewer fouls. And if you look at it, a couple of years ago when they first made the rules change, right, the teams committing the fewest fouls in the country were around fifteen per game. Right now, the teams committing the fewest fouls are around thirteen. Right, and it certainly makes the game more watchable to have fewer fouls called. Yeah, I, I think some of that, too, is that you naturally back off and revert to a logic that says, at least the good referees, they're not going to look at this and say, well, i got to blow the whistle. His hand, his second hand glanced at on his body while he was pulling the other one away. They said to emphasize, anytime two hands touch, it's an automatic whistle. I think some of that is is there's some internal logic. Now, they also know that if it's an egregious foul, if you put two hands on a guy – you're going to get a whistle. So you try not to do that. Um, I still think that the OVC is a bit whistle happy. But I think nationally Murray you're right. State, Murray State has a huge game tomorrow. So they host Jacksonville State. Absolutely. When, when they went down to Jacksonville State, uh, Murray State fell way behind early in that game. And although they rallied late, they were not able to pull out a victory. Now, Jacksonville State has struggled a little <clears> bit <throat> since then. They have five losses in conference play now. Yep. So uh, they're not even close to Murray State and Belmont 
when right. it comes to win loss record in conference play. So I, I'm not sure what to expect in tomorrow's game. The other thing about Jacksonville State, they don't have any scorers. Their leading scorers averaging 13 points a game. Right. And and the guy that we kind of looked to at the beginning of the year that we said, you know, this is the guy who's going to make the big leap was uh, Nobertus Giga from, you know, from Jacksonville State, the big man, the post player. And really, he's just not been there. Had a great game against Louisville in the NCAA tournament. Looked to be the dominant big man in the OVC coming back. And he just kind of hasn't. Everything seven and change scoring and seven and change rebound. Which is not bad. But after what he did against Louisville, I just expected more, you know. Um, and then they've got Malcolm Drumright, who's a, a really good guard. Um, they've got some skill guys. They've got some guys. That, and, and they've got other guys with size as well. So um, it's going to be a challenge, I think, for Murray State. The, the big thing that Murray State has to do is they have to avoid the slow start. Um, I, think, I think I heard Matt McMahon say whenever he was asked about that game, they kicked our butts for 28 minutes. You kind of have to avoid that. Yes. You know, you can't spot good teams big leads because no matter how good you are, it's almost impossible to come back from those. Let's be clear, though, as well as the racers are playing, this is the OVC. We know, we know that the winning streak has to continue yeah. because if we don't win the OVC, we're not going to the NCAA tournament. Well, and that's that's just how that works. We, you know? pr- we pretty much need to win the next six games. Yeah, and and honestly, um, you've got a cushion where you know Murray State's tied for first, and then the third place team is what two games back? Is that right? I believe so. I, I think that's right. Um, and that helps a little bit. It gives you a little bit of a cushion, but you really don't want to find that out. No, no. You, know, we, you don't we saw... want to risk having to play on Thursday of the OVC tournament. Absolutely, you want to make your first game Friday. Absolutely. Now. The stats don't bear that out since they've gone to a double bye in the OVC tournament. But logic dictates that the law of big numbers, that would catch up and be a positive to have that extra day's rest and not play many games. So let's, let's look at where the guys are. We're, we're going to look at the team. Uh, I got some stats here that I want your, I want your opinion on. These are stats that I've looked at for where we are in the season. We're coming up on the back end of the regular season I think that there's enough stuff here that we can in, impart some some information about what we've got with these guys. All right, so let's look at Jonathan Stark. In the country, Jonathan Stark is fifth in offensive win shares, eighth in total win shares, 18th in, fe- in free throw percentage, 19th in three points attempted, seventh in three pointers made per game, and 27th in scoring in the country. That's pretty dang good. It's pretty dang good. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good player because he's not sneaking up on anybody. Right. And despite all that, despite the fact that his statistics are among the best a guard has ever put up at Murray State, he's not getting any national notice. There's, right. There's been only one game where a pro scout has been at, to my knowledge, the it's only one game where I've been told that there was a scout there. Right. Well, and and I think you just kind of know what you get with John Stark. I mean, he's a six-foot guard who scores, who can shoot, um, has shown that he can be um, – he can make assists. He can make good passes. Uh, he scores at three levels pretty well. He's a known asset. You know, you kind of know what you're going to get with him. So, so let's look. Let's look at somebody else. Look, let's look at Terrell Miller. All right, now these are OVC stats. So these aren't the national stats, but I wanted to kind of put this out there because this is important. All right, so Terrell Miller in the OVC is second in defensive rebounding percentage, second in total defensive rebounds, third in field goal percentage, fourth in rebounds per game, fifth in two point field goal percentage, sixth in total rebounds. Seventh in true shooting percentage and ninth in points per game. <laughs> That's pretty effective. He's a first teamer. He's a first teamer. You've got to have that guy in your first team. So right there, you've got two first team guys before you even do anything else. So this is where it gets interesting because now you're going to go down into other guys. So John Morant, the freshman, these are national rankings. 14th in the country in assists, 13th in assists per game. 
41st in assist to turnover ratio as a true freshman. Wow. <laughs> wow, indeed. Wow. Whew. There, there are seniors who won't reach those lofty spots, and he's doing it as a 19-year-old kid who was playing high school ball this time last year. Right. Okay, so the other, the other guy I wanted to point out was Shaq Buchanan. Now, Shaq Buchanan in the OVC is 7th in steals per game, 8th in total steals, and ninth in two-point field goal percentage. Now, those two guys, when you start looking at what the team can bring at any given point, we know Terrell Miller's good. We know Jonathan Stark is good. We know that John Morant's good. The thing that we didn't know coming in, we said rebounding and defense needed to get better. Those are the two things. Every time you and I spoke about it, we're like, look, it doesn't matter how many we score. If our defense doesn't get better, if our rebounding doesn't get better, we're not going to win many games. I think what you're seeing now is, okay, you've got, you've got the ability now to, to rebound. Miller's rebounding at a high rate. Morant is rebounding at a high rate for his position. And defensively, you've got a guy like Shaq Buchanan who, quite frankly, turns defense into offense a lot. I mean, And the Racers have played decent defense this year. I'm not going to say they've played great defense. But I can they've, agree with they've that. been significantly better on defense this year than they were last year. Absolutely. Well, and, and it plays out. So... For Murray State, they've got three players in the OVC's top 10 in offensive efficiency ratings. All right? That three in the top three players in the top 10? All right, that's pretty good. Well, what about defense? Well, they've got two players in the top 10 in the defensive ratings. So they've they have brought that defensive level up without dropping back on offense very much. Uh, they're 10th in the NCAA in scoring margin, they're 21st in field goal percentage. They're 24th in three-point defense, and they're 28th in rebounding margin. This is a team that has improved. They saw those weaknesses. They saw those deficiencies, and they attacked them full bore and have really come forward. I think that's why you're seeing a 20-win Murray State team, you know, coming off of what we saw last year. This is a team that they knew what their weaknesses were. The coaching staff did a great job bringing guys in, and they also did a good job coaching them to the position where, hey, look, We've got to fix this. We've got to fix our rebound. We've got to fix our defense. And that's been a major point. I think they've done a very good job with it so far. Anything else on Racer basketball? You know what? I'm just looking forward to the rest of the season. It's going to be great. I want to talk about girls basketball. Fantastic. I want to start with the Lady Lakers and last night's game against Murray High. Now, let's set the stage. Murray High is ranked fourth in the state. Yeah. And might be underrated at fourth. Maybe. Somebody could argue that and probably have a good point. Fourth in the state. Going into last night's game, the closest game they had had against a team from the first region was against Callaway, Mm -hmm. and they had beaten them by 27 points. Yep. Last night, the Lady Lakers led Murray in the second half 35-33 to and wound up losing by just seven. Callaway played the best game that they have played this year. And if they can play that way on Monday in the first round of the district tournament by against Marshall County, they should be able to cruise to victory. Uh, I'm really excited about this Lady Laker team. I'm excited about what they can do this year. And I'm really optimistic about where they can go in the years to come because all their best players are young. Right. Agree. And we talked about this off air when I first saw you today. I asked you the question, how good is Charlie Settle? <laughs> oh, my goodness. She's fantastic. And the thing that we talked about was, yeah, she's great. She is a fantastic basketball player. Let's not forget that what year is she? Sophomore. She's a sophomore. And then you look around in the rest of the team, and you're like, oh, there's some really good basketball players on this team. And then you started telling me, well, what what are, what are we looking at for the age? We're talking about freshmen, right? I mean, we're not freshmen and sophomores. Freshmen and sophomores are all these teams are, and you can take a team in the top five of the state, and you can play them as close as anybody has all year. There's something special there. I mean, there really is. There, I don't want to. If if I'm if I'm in the the district tournament or even the regional tournament, or let's just kind of really get grandiose in the Sweet Sixteen, and I see a team like Callaway. On my on my side of the bracket where I'm at, 
you just kind of have to sigh and go, dang it. Because there's a shot that that team puts it all together, and you don't want to play a team like that. Indeed. Now, let's be clear. Murray High is the best team in the region. They're one of the best teams in the state. Agreed. They are phenomenally good. <laughs> they are so and, good. And if they, oh if they make it to the state tournament, all of us should be rooting for them. And, and I'm we sure, will. Yeah. I'm sure we all will be. Now, having said that, oh, my. They got a horrible draw when they drew for the Sweet 16 because – Whoever makes it from the first region will have to play a team from the region with the number one ranked team in the state. And then in the second round, I think you potentially play a team from the region with the number two ranked team in the yeah. state. It's just brutal. Right. No, it really is. And and the thing we all know about tournament play, it's cumulative. The effects are cumulative. Playing tough games back to back to back. That weighs on you. It's heavy. It's a hard slog. Good teams can't do it. Now, also on girls basketball, I read an awesome article yesterday okay. about Dave Kindred. Dave Kindred, a former sports writer for the Louisville Courier Journal, the Atlanta Constitution, um, the Washington Post, the Sporting News. He's won about every major award that a sports writer could win. He retired a few years ago and moved back to Illinois, uh, where he grew up. Mm -hmm. And he started going to girls' basketball games. And the girls' team there at Morton High School, they call them the Lady Potters, uh, he now writes a blog about their games. Imagine having <laughs> someone like Dave Kindred writing about your high school basketball team. They've almost got it as good as Callaway does. Now, the lady... The <laughs> lady having Will Aubrey write their stuff up. The Lady <laughs> Potters, uh, they've won three straight state championships, okay? But they go to... You go to the gym, and there are games before the boys' game, and it's about half full or less, and then... Everybody shows up, and it's packed for the boys' game, even though the boys' team has one state tournament appearance <laughs> in the history of the school. Uh, and it just goes back to something that I observed a long time ago. In this country, we have treated our sons better than our daughters for far too long, and it needs to stop. I can appreciate that, and... and I'm going, I'm going to go into a sporting arena that you're not a huge fan of. When we talk about soccer, there's no question that women's soccer in the United States is far superior to men's soccer in the United States. Both in the development of players, uh, the talent level of players on a global stage, uh, and the product that we put on the field. And the thing is, girls can be great athletes. Absolutely. Uh, Kindred told a story about uh, his, I think it was about his sister maybe and uh, and a cousin or something, and, and then one of his granddaughters. Anyway, um, the two older women had been cheerleaders, and so he asked his granddaughter if she wanted to be a cheerleader, and she said, I want to be the one they're cheering for. Dang right. Go for it. I, you know, and, and honestly, I think that's the biggest issue. And I think it's changing. It's not where it needs to be, but it's better. And I think as long as we can honestly give an acknowledgement of where we are and realize that where we are is not the end, but merely a point of where we're going, um, I think that we can actually change that. I think we can make a more equitable field. Uh, for for boys and girls growing up and wanting to play sports, uh, and for men and women in their sporting, I think as long as as long as you're building something, you can do that. It's just a different. It, it, we we can't lose sight of the end goal, and we can't also get to the point where we are willing to destroy all the progress we've made because we haven't reached our goal yet. Anything else on sports? <sighs> I love this time of year. It's it's just great. Basketball's coming around. Uh, the the boys teams, uh, both Murray and Callaway's boys, they we knew they were going to be rebuilding. 
they're actually ahead of where I thought they would be. Both of those teams, uh, very talented guys. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how they progress, and I'm looking forward to the fourth district uh, tournament on the boys' side. The girls' side, <laughs> come out and see the show. It's, no, it's, it's just fun. <laughs> that brings to close this edition of the Improbability Engine. Okay.